Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars, some of my favourite people, and we've got one for you today. Anne Whittacombe has just returned from a life-changing visit to Mauritania, which is in Africa. She's an ambassador for Sparna.org, an organisation that looks after the welfare and health of animals. And I'm delighted to say that Anne Whittacombe is on the show today to tell us all about it. How are you, Anne? I'm very well indeed, thank you. How are you? I'm really good, Anne. Thank you for coming on today to talk to us about your trip to Africa with Sparna.org. Tell us why you're so passionate about these donkeys particularly. There are 70,000 of them that need our help. Is that right? Mauritania, which is where I've just come back from, is one of the poorest countries in Africa. And it's a Saharan country. Uh, And its nearest source of water is the Senegal River, which is 300 kilometers away from the capital of Mauritania. Thus far, it's piped. But when it gets into the capital, it stops. It's not piped into individual homes or dwellings or anywhere. Big capital, home to a million people. So 70,000 donkeys every single day of the week transport the water from the various pipe points uh, to the individual houses uh, and uh, buildings, whatever they may be. Now, that's 70,000 a day. The 35,000 you're thinking of is the number of free veterinary treatments which Sparna gave out in Mauritania alone, just Mauritania, uh, last year. And some of those donkeys are well cared for. So that's fine. That's an ordinary working donkey. But too many of them have either got wounds where they've been hit by their owners. The wounds have gone septic. They've been hit by the carts when they stop bumping into the back of them. That's gone septic. They're uh, they're lame because one or more of their hooves has grown too long. Uh, And uh, some of them are half starved. And some donkeys have just about all of those problems. I have some sympathy with them in a way because, of course, I worked in Nairobi for nearly a year doing a radio show, believe it or not, and I went into those suburbs and saw the grim poverty that the people are living in. So it's unsurprising that the animals are not well either. I guess the job of Sparna is to educate more than anything, isn't it? Well, it certainly is. And you're you're quite right about humans. Uh, But... In countries like these, where working donkeys are uh, something like 400,000 of them in Mauritania, where you've got so many working donkeys, the fate of the animals is tied up with the fate of the humans. Because if they don't have their donkey fit and ready to work in the morning, then they don't have a living. And so a fit and healthy donkey can actually keep a human being alive. So their fates are intertwined, but you've hit the nail on the head with the use of that word education. And what we do is this, our deal with the owners when they bring in the donkey is we'll treat this donkey completely free and we'll get it well, even if we have to keep it in uh, for a few days, we'll still do that and we'll get it well again. But what you, the owner, has to do is to listen to us for about five minutes while we tell you how to avoid that problem in the future. And then we expect you to go and do that. Uh, And so we, for example, one of the great successes out there has been we say look if all you do is just put a piece of strong rope across the back of the cart that is what will hit the donkey not the cart itself Uh, and then uh, the donkey uh, won't get clobbered and uh, it was heartening to see quite a number uh, of donkeys and carts that had employed that system so the word is getting round Uh, We can treat them, we can teach them about how care of the hooves and that sort of thing. We can teach them about diet, not just let the donkeys live on cardboard or whatever it may be. But we also educate in schools themselves because um, there's nothing wrong with kids growing up to believe that it really is okay uh, to care for animals, that it's not quirky, that it's something that's actually very sensible as well as compassionate uh, to do. I went over there to Africa and it changed my life forever. We think we have poverty in this country. Until you've seen those slums, we don't. Are you implying that some of them intentionally mistreat the animals or is it just the fact that they don't have the knowledge and the money and the power to treat them well? Is it a mixture of both? It's a mixture of both, but by and large, it's just ignorance. You know, I mean, they hadn't thought of putting something across the cart to stop bashing the donkey. I mean, as I say, it's in their interests that they have a donkey that's fit and healthy to work. So uh, they will listen 
if if you give them the necessary tools uh, to look after donkeys and the necessary knowledge, they will listen because it's in their economic interest to do so. How did going over there to Mauritania change your life? Well, I wouldn't say it changed my life, but it, it was pretty horrifying stuff. I mean, I have worked in the third world. I've worked with a leprosy mission, for example. Uh, so I do know what third world living looks like. But every time you encounter it, it's still horrifying. Uh, even if you know exactly what you're going to see, it, it is, as you say, you know, we think we know what poverty is. We haven't a clue. Uh, it, it, it is uh, very, very deep there indeed. And just basic things, we turn on our taps and water comes out. And what's more, not only does water come out, but pure water comes out. And you know, that is a luxury unheard of there. So uh, I say, as I say, I don't think it changes my life, but I'd like to change the lives of those who live there. Uh, and one of the good things that Spana does is to work with governments throughout the third world. Um, and the current campaign is against the donkey skin trade. I don't know if you know about this. Uh, but China um, imports donkey skins because they're used in beauty creams, heaven help us. And by importing donkey skins, of course, what it does is drive up the price of donkeys in the poor countries. And it also encourages theft, because if you want to export a skin, oh, where do you find it? Oh, steal your neighbor's donkey. Well, if you're a Mauritanian in a dirt poor country like that, and you wake up in the morning and your donkey's gone, your living has gone. And we've had particular success in Mali, Botswana, Zimbabwe, in persuading governments there to, to take the trade in donkey skins seriously. A final question on Africa. Is there hope? We see all these charity events, these rock concerts, these charities that raise money. I was there in 1998 and virtually yeah. nothing has changed. Is there hope for Africa? I think there is hope for Africa. But one of the things that makes me very angry is that the whole of the Western world spends trillions, trillions uh, or if you put it all together, uh, on overseas aid. And yet there are still vast tracts of the third world that have no water supply, you know, something as basic as a water supply. Now, I think we really ought to get our priorities in order. I mean, don't fund Ethiopian pop groups. Uh, fund water supply, uh, which is absolutely crucial to, to healthy living. Uh, I mean, the average age uh, at which people die uh, in Mauritania is 63. You know, here we'll go on into our 90s and not think anything of it. Uh, so uh, I feel angry about that. I also feel angry about people who begrudge foreign aid. I think we'll just go and live there uh, and see what it's like. Um, but yes, I believe that there is hope, but it's going to have to be long term hope because, of course, one of Africa's biggest problems is just a series of corrupt governments. Really, it is shocking in 2018 that we're having this conversation, isn't it? I agree with you entirely. If you want to find out more, you can go to the Spana website. S-P-A-N-A dot org is the place to go and donate. And you can give money to the education of the people and to the health of the donkeys. That's what we're talking about today with Anne Widdicombe. Spana dot org is the website. What a year it's been for you, Miss Widdicombe. Has it ever been more interesting and diverse? Your life seems to have taken interesting turns in the last six months, doesn't it? Well, not only the last six months, the last seven years, I think. Um, I took a very conscious decision when I retired as a member of Parliament. I said, right, from the day and the hour that Parliament is dissolved that year, that's the same day and hour in which I cease to be an MP. And therefore, from that moment onwards, I haven't any obligation to think or act or take decisions as though I were an MP. And therefore, things that I steadily refused to do while I was an MP, such as Strictly Come Dancing, for example, I was suddenly free to do. Uh, and none of it's been planned out. Uh, one thing has led to another to another. Uh, Strictly, for example, uh, led to a live tour, which led to pantomime with Craig Revel Horwood, which led to an appearance at the Royal Opera House of all places in a Donizetti opera. Uh, and, and so it's just gone on. And I just say yes or no, depending on what I think I like. Now, I'd always said no. Uh, both while I was an MP and afterwards, always said no to Big Brother. And then this year they said, well, it's going to be different. We're celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage. It's going to be called the Year of the Woman. There are going to be very serious debates. We're trying to appeal to a, a, a new section of viewers, blah, blah, blah. And I said to my agent, do I believe any of this? And he said, well, you can always walk if you don't. You know, you're not a prisoner. You can always walk out. So uh, I decided after an awful lot of agonising, it wasn't an easy decision like Strictly was, uh, awful lot of agonising, I decided I, w I would risk it. 
uh, and I did. And I thought I'd be out after the first week. Do you know what I think you've got is the Jim Davidson effect. We are so sick of PC people, whether we agree with you or not. And many of your opinions I don't actually agree with. But one I do love is the fact that you have an opinion, you state it, you stick by it, and I can then discuss it with you. We don't seem to like that anymore. I greatly admire your courage to take on people who don't want to debate. I think it's really worrying. Now, I agree with you entirely. We're losing free speech in this country. And the sad thing is that when I was a politician, I had completely free speech. I could utter what opinions I liked in the House of Commons. Uh, And uh, now I'm what they call a celeb. I hate that word. Um, I've got free speech because I answer to nobody. Uh, But there are millions of, of ordinary men and women in this country who are doing a day's work, the same job, day in, day out who are watching what they say every moment because there have been so many instances of people being disciplined or even in occasion sacked uh, because of some view that they've expressed which doesn't please their colleagues. Uh, And we do now live in a snowflake society, uh, even in the universities of all places, where it should be great hives of of buzzing debate in our universities. Uh, No, they just know platform people whose views they don't like. Now, I think that the fact that I came runner up was a massive endorsement of free speech, because like you, a lot of the viewers wouldn't have agreed with everything I was saying. Perhaps in some cases, anything I was saying. What they did agree with was the freedom to say it. Yeah, I've stopped doing phone-ins because the reaction now online is so vitriolic and so vile and so offensive and so personal. I don't think you can do that type of thing anymore, whether you can have an opinion about anything. And it's not healthy because whether we're right or wrong, we have to keep talking, don't we, and debating. Oh, I agree. I mean, I will debate with anybody. As I always say, I'll debate with a Holocaust denier. You know, I will debate with anybody uh, in order to expose what I consider to be the fallacies in that view. Uh, And so I always think anybody should debate with me with exactly the same aim in mind. Yeah. Very finally, I want to talk about a mutual friend of ours that we lost this week. I know you were at the audience with Ken Dodd. Incredibly sad. It's not a tragedy because we had 90 years of genius, so we shouldn't be sad in that way. But what a loss to show business. It is a loss because, of course, he kept going right up to the end. It is a loss. And it was such a special brand of humour, Ken Dodd's. Um, it was it was a, a, a mixture of the innocent and the naughty, but it was never ever rude and offensive. Uh, and uh, he was it was just so wonderful and innocent and all embracing. Uh, and uh, I think it's a huge loss because there's very little of that left. So sad, but what memories and that audience with you were I think was probably his greatest ever TV appearance. It was magical that night, wasn't it? I certainly enjoyed it, and so did my mother, who was sitting beside me. Oh, she absolutely adored it. Yeah, well, we all like Ken Dodd. I mean, I can remember as a child when I was I used to watch Ken Dodd on very old television, which had two channels. I'd love to talk to you again in more detail. We've got to go because we've run out of time, but I wish you all the best. Okay. Barna.org is the place you can find more details. Uh, millions of donkeys are at risk and you can help save their lives and at least their health and do some good. You go to Sparna.org for more information. And Whittacombe, thank you for your time.